on what Jesus is doing with the Lord's Supper, as it were. Okay? So here's what's going on. First of all, the Old Testament promises one thing. There will be a new covenant to come. Jesus didn't come up with that idea. He's fulfilling a promise to the prophets. I will read you this out of Jeremiah to show you what I mean. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them out of the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. By the way, Passover is all about that covenant when he took them out of the hand. It's the celebration of that covenant. My covenant that they broke, Yahweh says, that's why he needs a new covenant. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer, this is the new covenant, shall each one teach his neighbor, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord." for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So this is the new covenant language that Jeremiah didn't see. He's living in the old covenant, but he recognizes there's a need for a new covenant. Again in Jeremiah, he again declares that whatever the covenant was out of Egypt doesn't work, and he talks about a new covenant coming when God will grab his people. Jeremiah 16, 1. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought us up up, uh, the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, for I will bring them back to the land that I have given their fathers. So we know that there is a need for an extended new covenant. How's that going to work itself out? This is what this section's about. Jesus is laying the foundation of the meal for the new covenant, and he's juxtaposing it by adding elements of what they called the cedar or the old covenant meal, but he changes it because he wraps it around new covenant ideas. So let's see how he does that. Well, the text first begins with our friend Judas. We don't know much about Judas except that he was a a thief. What motivated him, that's the question, to betray Jesus? I have two theories. One, he just wanted the 40 pieces of silver. That to me isn't satisfactory, not with who he was. I think what he was doing personally is Judas was trying to force Jesus' hand. For time and again, people are trying to make him king by force. He clearly wasn't going to do it on his own, so Judas thought, if I had him arrested, this will call, cause the revolution. He had no more idea of who Jesus was than the rest of the disciples. Anyways, who was one of the twelve? The right away, that, the fact that Mark puts who was one of the twelve. Twelve is a huge thing around the Exodus motif, the original, the twelve tribes. We must understand that this is a reconstituted Israel around the disciples. That's why there's the 12. They represent that. And so that is meaning that whatever's going on here, Mark wants you to know this has to do with covenant. This has to do with Exodus. And I'm going to show you because it's one of the 12 that will be there. This is only going to be for the 12. Went to the chief priests in order to betray them to them. And of course, when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. So there you go. The deal's done. They're excited. They don't have to worry about the crowds. They can arrest him in secret. It's a very, very uh, horrible world. Probably the way that people still do it today. Anyways, now we get into it. And it was on the first day of the unleavened bread when they sacrificed the Passover lamb. Now, many people think they had the dinner when the time the lambs were being sacrificed. But that's a misunderstanding. The first part of the day of the unleavened bread, the day changed when the sun went down, okay? They didn't sacrifice the lambs until what we would call the next day. So when Jesus is having his dinner, he's not having it at the same time other people are. You would have your Passover meal at the end of the day, not at the beginning, not at the first part of the day. So Jesus is not having a traditional Passover meal, Because he 
later that day, needs to be crucified because he becomes the sacrificial lamb, okay? So this is before when the lamb is being slaughtered. This is before that day practically. It is the beginning of the day. The language is and on the first part of the day of the unleavened bread means probably six o'clock on they were meeting that evening and the sacrificial lamb would happen after you slept, but it's still seen as the same day in their calendar. Anyways, his disciples said to him, where will, we, will you have us go and prepare for you, to, for you to eat the Passover? Everyone ate the Passover. And Jesus sent his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Now, right away, though, it stands out here, especially, to, obviously, Jesus recognizes they're threatened. He has to uh, keep everything on the down low. Why do we know that? Because no men carried a jar of water. That was a woman's job. This would stand out in the streets. So this is cloak and dagger stuff. So Jesus has prepared this so his disciples won't get arrested because they're wanted to be arrested. Go find a guy that he trusts, and you'll tell who he is. You know, it's kind of like going in on a date, and I'll be wearing the yellow jacket uh, that stands out so that it only could be one person. Like, there's only one guy that would be carrying the jar of water. And they follow him, so this has been prepared. And whenever he enters, say to the master of the house, this, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with the disciples? Jesus has prepared all of this beforehand, and he will show you a large upper, upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us, and they now beget to get together. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. But they don't really prepare it exactly the way a Passover was. At least Mark doesn't let us in. There's no mention of lamb. There's no mention of the four cups. There's no mention of a seat for a... Uh, oh, I forget the prophet now. Ezekiel. There's, or is it Elijah? It's Elijah. Anyways... All of these things that you do in a cedar, all we hear about is bread and wine, which are staples, but they're not the main symbols of the eat meal. So, obviously something's going on here. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. So this is that first night still, right? This is before the Passover is usually eaten. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Now that is a radical thing. You only ate, as I've told you again and again, with truly trusted, the people you valued. And here we have this situation where people are eating. And uh, yeah, and so it, it, this is a really radical thing. And he's, he's saying to them, somebody's going to betray you. They, their response is interesting, I think. They began to be sorrowful, sor so, sorrowful, and to say to him and one another, is it I? Doesn't that leave you something? How many of us, if we heard that, would we say, it is it I? Well, here's what I think. Why would you say, is it I, unless the thought has crossed your mind? I don't think at all Judas was the only one that wanted to force Jesus' hand. I absolutely think that some of them have had thoughts of some way betraying to make this thing happen. They all want the revolution and Jesus isn't doing it. Why otherwise would you say, is it I? He said to him, it's the one of the twelve, the one dipping the bread in the dish with me. Why did they eat a common bread, by the way, in a common dish? Because when you ate the common dish, you were one with one another. So what this action is, is an absolute breaking of a personal covenant with another person. It's a very, very dark moment in the Gospels. All right? For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. So this is the Son of Man. We've got this language of the Ancient of Days defeating evil, all from Daniel 7. As it goes, it's written of him. This is going to happen. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Now, there's lots of debate about what that means. I'm not going to get into it. I think jo uh, Judas is a really bad and complex figure. I also don't think he's worse than the one, those who deny. If you deny a king... Or if you betray a king, both of you in the ancient world deserve the death penalty. So anyways, we'll, we'll leave with that and hope maybe in your Bible study you can discuss what maybe you think of Judas and the rest of them. 
It would have been better for that man if he'd not been born. The question is, does he see talking about an eschatological judgment or the reality that he is going to go and kill himself very soon from guilt and shame? We don't know. There's just, we add things in in our head and it's not there. It's just, I, I don't know what he means there. And that's just being honest. And then the, as they were eating, he took the bread after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to them, and he said, take, this is my body. Now, the, bo- the bread is all about the exodus, and it's about the thankfulness that we were given. You can't help but think of the manna that they're going to be given in the exodus. It is a celebration of the unity of the church that is celebrating together deliverance. Now, rather than the unleavened bread, the bread represents Jesus. So that's your first change in the Exodus, sorry, the cedar or the dinner to celebrate Exodus. Because remember, this is a second Exodus with second meanings. Not that the first one wasn't great, but the first one is done. That time is done. And churches often uh, celebrate cedars. And my only comment is, as long as it doesn't trump the Lord's Supper, which is the ultimate Exodus meal of the new covenant, which we serve. All right. Well, what, what does he do then? Well, we're coming up to the, the blood. So we know the body is about unity, eating it together. So that's why when we take the body together, we're making a vow that we're one in Christ, that we are not going to turn on each other. Oh, if we took that serious. Now what we have here is the next part is the blood. So a little bit of history there to help us understand. Blood poured out in a, the first covenant was poured upon this, and I'm just going to read Exodus just quickly. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Okay, so the altar is part of the blood that he's representing to God, he's throwing at God. And now, this covenant, it's going to come back on the people. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it, the old covenant, in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And now we know they can't. So, but this is also judgment, because now when the blood falls upon them, that means they, just like God, had taken the blood as part of the covenant. They're now going to be taking the blood of the sacrifices upon themselves based on this vow. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. In other words, you are now bound in this covenant. The blessings or cursings fall upon you. You have had this poured upon you because you said you're going to follow this covenant. The difference with Jesus is radical. Also, the other thing about the blood of the covenant is it's related with deliverance. Let's go to Zechariah 9, 9 to 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Sing aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a, monkey, of a donkey. So right away we see that this is wrapped up with what's just happened. So we have to take serious, when anytime you see blood in covenant, and we know this has just been fulfilled, then we have to read it closely. I will cut off the char- chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut out, cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. Who is this? Me, he. Well, they're, of course, they know it to be Jesus. His rule shall be from sea to, have, to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. By the way, they didn't understand this before, and, and Zechariah is a tough book. They would have saw he is a, maybe a messianic leader, but the New Testament writers clearly see this as Jesus. And then we get to the covenant. As for you, also because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. This covenant is to come. The, because of the blood of my covenant with you that he's going to make. So this is a new covenant language. I will set your prisoners free. Jesus talks that that's his ministry from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoner, hope. Today I declare to you that I will restore you in double. So that's what the blood is about. The blood is, unlike pouring it on us, as if we're the ones that have to make this confession and keep up the covenant, Jesus offers his body. This is a very powerful, and he offers us his blood. It's his covenant. He's going to maintain it. 
He knows we can't do it. That's what this new exodus is about. When you take the blood, the forgiveness of sins comes with it because it's not up to you. So the worst sinner can come to the table of the Lord. Unlike the first covenant where you are banned from those things unless your behavior was such a way. So that's the main point. Unlike the old covenant, old covenant was what it was. This new covenant is also going to send prisoners free. And that's what it's talking about when you take the wine. But again, in both the bread and the wine, we take it together. So we're saying this is how we're going to treat each other. It's, that's the symbolic. Of course, Jesus says, and he took the cup when he had given thanks, he gave them, and they all drank of it. The cup of the new covenant he's given them. Now, there's this one last part. Jesus said, and he said to them, which is the blood from my covenant, which is poured for many. What does he mean by that? This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured for many. I think he's fulfilling Isaiah 53. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many. It's almost language true. So this, he's giving this wine because he's the one who gives it all away. He's the one that can do it, and he's borrowing the sins. This is all wrapped up and makes intercession for the transgressors. So that's what's going on there. Now, what, how does he end? Well, he ends and he says, Truly, I tell you, I will never eat, drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. What he's saying is there's an eschatological component, and this is the last meal he has in the old age. What would that mean to the listener? Well, there's a promise of God delivering the world. This meal's left to point to that, okay? He's not going to eat it again until the kingdom comes in its fullness. In other words, he's done eating under the old covenant. He's waiting now. The new covenant has been laid. He's put a new dinner for this new exodus that's only around bread and wine. It doesn't have to do with lamb or any of these other things. And it all has to do with the forgiveness of sins and unity together and a true exodus. And, of course, the exodus is out of sin, the devil, and death. That is what he has delivered us from. So what would he be referring to about this day he will eat again in the kingdom of God? Well, it's a prophecy out of Isaiah 25. On the mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine. This is what he's referring to. He will not eat again until this moment happens when this is fulfilled. Of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up the mountain and the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For I, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord that we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So he's saying, after this meal, I'm done. The old covenant's done. The new Exodus meal's been given to you. You now take it in light of what I've done, just like they took the cedar, cedar in light of the first Exodus. This is the new Exodus meal, the Lord's Supper. But it's also ate in light of the fact that one day we are going to have what Isaiah 25 says, this amazing feast where people are set free, where people, death is conquered, and that's what he's pointing to when he says, I'm not going to eat it again, because he knows this is coming. All right? So some questions out of this. The first one I have, how are the new covenant and the old covenant related? How do they work together? How does this point to how they work together? That's a tough question, but I want you guys to start thinking about that. You've heard me talk a lot about it. Now, here's the second part. Why do Christians not celebrate the cedar? And what has taken its place? I think I pretty much answered that, but I'll let you guys work through that. What does communion mean about covenant in a community? There's something to do about the community. It's not just an individual thing. And how does it represent a vow to maintain love towards each other other person within it? So that's a, that's a good question for you. And my favorite question, because I, I think this is the least understood about communion, is it points to something. 
What future meal might communion or the Lord's Supper point to? I just talked about that. What does that mean about the meaning we are to take out of the meal as we partake? How? Is it just about looking back? Or does this meal have something to do with the moving, looking forward? All right, I hope that helps. We got communion this Sunday. I'm so excited. I hope that it'll be very much more meaningful with you guys taking this. Bless you.